it's nice to be actually in front of people. For the past two and a half years since this pandemic thing, I've been doing this, my talks mostly in Zoom. So tonight I'm gonna to be pretending that you're all little boxes on my, on my laptop. So um, before I give my talks on Boston fires, I ask if any sparks or, um, or jinks are in the audience. Before I give my talk on the Ponzi scheme, I ask if anybody in the financial world is in the audience. So since tonight we're talking about an escape from a federal prison, are there anyone here from the legal profession, the judiciary, perhaps uh, a U.S. Marshal in the audience? No? Okay. No jail No jail oh, That's. I never even considered to ask if someone was an escapee. Um, so tonight, what I'm going to talk about is the real story behind my recently published novel. It's called Inseparable. And the story is based on the actual escape by three men, Frank Morris and the brothers John and Clarence Anglin, who left Alcatraz prison without permission on June 11th, 1962, just about 60 years ago. Now in my novel, two of the escapees, the Anglin brothers, are helped to freedom by a 13-year-old boy who finds them on a Sausalito beach. Um, he then helps the Anglins evade the cops, the FBI, the Coast Guard, and an obsessed member of the media, as well as the boy's mother. Worldwide, we are fascinated by prisons, aren't we? In Paris, people flock to the side of the Bastille. In Dublin, there's a waiting list for tickets to the infamous Gaul. And where do you suppose is the number one paid attraction for tourists in the San Francisco Bay Area? Of course, it is Alcatraz. This is a former military prison from the Civil War. And in 1933, the federal government, dealing with an epic rise in violent crime during the Great Depression, announced they would convert Alcatraz into a federal penitentiary. Now, many residents of the Bay Area were not happy about that. They disputed the government's contention that the prison was, due to its location in the chilly San Francisco Bay, escape proof. To prove their point, some residents cooked up this publicity stunt. That is Anastasia Smith, who in October of 1933 swam the mile and three quarters from Alcatraz Island to San Francisco in just under an hour. Now, defenders of the prison plan scoffed at this demonstration, saying that she, as well as the entire women's swimming team, which later performed the same feat, were trained athletes, and that wouldn't uh, happen with prisoners, but the fact is they proved it could be done. Meanwhile, work on converting the island into a federal prison proceeded. Now, the place was in pretty tough shape. Uh, 70 years of use by the Army had left it um, in pretty bad condition. Among the many security measures added were gun turrets around the island, realigned corridors to prevent prisoner access. 269 cells got new steel bars while fencing was installed around the building which housed the inmates. The guards would live on the island with their families. A two-lane bowling alley was built for their recreation. And within a year, Alcatraz Prison was ready to open. <coughs> This is where the government would send some of the country's most vicious killers, including Machine Gun Kelly, Al Capone, Whitey Bulger, Bumpy Johnson, Robert Stroud, and Alvin Karpus, plus dozens of other prisoners whose main offense was that they kept escaping from other federal <laughs> and state prisons. So, yeah, let's gather all the escape artists in the country and put them in one place. What could possibly go wrong? How about almost three dozen escapes, many of which ended in the death of the escapees, or attempted escapees? The most famous escape is the one to which we do not know the result, one which clearly has captured our imagination for over 60 years. It is the story depicted in the 1979 Clint Eastwood 
directed by Don Siegel, the movie Escape from Alcatraz, of the 1962 escape by three inmates. Let's start with Frank Morris. Now, Frank had the good fortune to be portrayed by Clint Eastwood in that 1979 movie. Morris, well, there's no easy way to say this, but he had a pretty awful childhood. In 1937, when he was just 11 years old, his parents abandoned him at a Washington, D.C. church. He spent time in an orphanage and was then placed in foster care, but was never adopted. As a teenager, Frank started committing petty crimes and soon graduated to auto theft and armed robbery. After his capture and conviction for bank robbery, he was sentenced to the Louisiana State Penitentiary. Now, Frank escapes, and he manages to keep from getting caught for almost a whole year. After he was caught, and we can assume they were pretty angry, they sent him to Alcatraz in 1960. This is Alan West. He was a car thief from New York City. He had the misfortune to be considered so unimportant to the plot of the Clint Eastwood movie that director Don Siegel didn't even use his real name in the picture. Siegel called his character Charlie Butts, which I think is indicative of how he felt about Alan West. The real Alan West had been sent to Alcatraz in 1957 after several attempted escapes from prison. By early 1961, Frank Morris and Alan West had been joined in Alcatraz by two brothers, John and Clarence Angle. What makes their partnership with, John, with Frank Morris so interesting to me, what I, I used in the novel, is that while Frank grew up without any family, the Anglin brothers had an abundance of family. They were among 13 children of George and Rachel Anglin, they were itinerant farm workers who would follow the harvest between Florida and Michigan during the 1920s and 1930s. Now, just before the war, they settled in Ruskin, Florida, where they raised and harvested tomatoes. Unfortunately, the stability of a permanent home was not enough for John and Clarence, who, along with their other brother, Alfred, began committing petty crimes around Ruskin. They graduated to gas station stick-ups and eventually a bank robbery. Caught and convicted, John and Clarence were sentenced to the federal penitentiary in Atlanta. After several escape attempts, both were in Alcatraz by early 1961, where they met Frank Morris and Alan West. The irony of Alcatraz was that it was chosen as a maximum security prison because it sat in the middle of San Francisco Bay. But being in the middle of San Francisco Bay meant it was surrounded by salt water and salty air. And salt, ladies and gentlemen, is a corrosive material, uh, uh, compound. So by 1961, Alcatraz was literally falling apart. And this was the weakness that would be exploited by Morris, West, and the Anglins. Four men who had spent countless hours figuring out ways to escape from different prisons all over the country. It somehow seems inevitable that they would gravitate towards each other and combine their experience and skills to solve all the challenges confronting them. The biggest one being the bay itself. Because look, Water doesn't have to be ice cold to kill you, like it did Leonardo DiCaprio's character in the Titanic. It only takes water under 70 degrees to cause hypothermia. The temperature of the water in San Francisco Bay is usually in the 50s, and that's in June. So with those temperatures, it only takes about an hour or two for the human body to lose consciousness, and death would follow in about six hours. So up until 1961, any escapees who had made it to the water but weren't captured or shot had drowned. Oh, and here's an interesting side note I learned in my research. To keep the prisoners from building up a resistance to the cold, 
the water in the prison's showers were kept at a very high temperature, and they could not be adjusted. So they could not get used to cold temperatures. So now the big question, how do you get across the bay without going into it? According to the FBI, the answer was in an article in the November 1960 issue of Popular Mechanics. It described how a hunter used pieces of rubber to make goose decoys. To make the decoys waterproof, he used rubber cement, that's the type you can buy in any stationery or drugstore. And the chemical compound in rubber cement will fuse the pieces of rubber together in a process called vulcanization. Now, issues of popular mechanics were available to inmates in the prison library, and rubber cement was among the art supplies made available to the inmates. We know that Frank Morris read the magazine because after the escape, they found an issue with another article on how to make waterproof life vests using vulcanization. Pretty strong argument. This is where he got the idea to make a raft. But where do you make a raft big enough for four people? They sure as hell couldn't do it in their cells. Most investigators believe it was Frank who noticed on the other side of a metal vent at the back of every cell was a service corridor. Frank, using the decaying condition of the prison, salt water, using that to his advantage, he chipped away at the concrete around the vent until he could remove it. Then he squeezed into the corridor and began exploring. He shimmied up a water pipe and found just above the cell bar this space under the roof of the prison. It was a perfect spot for them to build a workshop. Now, working hours would have to be between lights out, which at Alcatraz was 9.30 every night, and wake up, which was at 7 the next morning. In between those two times, Guards patrolled the blocks of cells just about every half hour. They would look in on the sleeping prisoners, but rarely roused them. In fact, with expenses at the prison rising, there were fewer guards on duty, so the chances of a surprise count, you know, rousing the prisoners out of bed at 11, 12 at night, was very low. But still, guards are gonna notice a man is not in his bed. So what do you do? Now another irony, pointed out to me by a US Marshal who had worked on this case. Alcatraz had been one of the strictest penitentiaries in the country, but by the late 1950s, had embraced the concept of prison reform. And inmates were given access to paints, brushes, and canvas. Frank Morris, Alan West, John and Clarence Anglin used those supplies to make paper mache, for which they made fake heads, which they painted using the art supplies. They glued hair from the prison barbershop, where they also work, on top of the fake heads, which they placed on their pillows. Then they'd stuff blankets under another blanket, make it look like a body. So passing guards would assume the prisoners were asleep when in fact they were busy in the workshop they had set up right above the cell block. They also used the paper mache paste to patch and paint the chipped concrete around the vents to hide their work during the day. Okay, so now they have a workshop where they can build their raft. The arts program provided all the rubber cement they would need. Plenty of hair in the barber shop. Now they had to figure out where to get all the raincoats they would need to build the raft. Well, here's another bit of luck for the escapees. Prisoners were used as laborers outside the prison building, and so they were issued rubber raincoats for days when the weather was poor. San Francisco Bay, how many, what are the odds it's gonna be a, a, a rainy day? So the other inmates were more than happy to help because there's nothing a con likes more than sticking it to the warden and the guards. Oh. So they would wear their raincoats into the 
exercise yard and then drop them onto the ground where they would be picked up by one of the four escaping By early 1962, they were spending nights in the workshop constructing their raft. So now I'm sure you're asking the same question as the authorities did. How did you move a raft big enough for four men from the workshop all the way down to the beach? It's tough enough getting the guys out of that, that prison. How are you going to get that big raft down there? Well, that was another very clever part. They would inflate it after they got down to the beach. They used a concertina. It's also known as a squeeze box. Modified with a hose connected from the bellows to a corner of the raft. Moving the bellows in and out, just like that Who song, and the raft inflated. Then, just as we saw at the end of the Clint Eastwood movie, the three men got in the raft and drifted off into San Francisco Bay. Wait a minute. Did I just say three men? Yeah. But didn't I say there were four men building the raft? Yeah, there were. But it, it turns out that Alan West was a much better mason than he should have been. And the paste he made to cover the chipped away area around the vent in his cell had hardened like concrete. So the night of June 11, 1962, he couldn't loosen the vent from the hole he had made and he was stuck inside his cell as Frank Morris, John Anglin, and Clarence Anglin floated out into dark San Francisco Bay. The next morning, June 12, 1962, 7 a.m., started as a typical day on the rock. In some ways, Alcatraz was no different than hundreds of other prisoners, prisons in that inmates followed a strict routine which began after a siren woke them at 7 o'clock. Prisoners were then to get up, wash, make their beds, and stand at attention at their cell doors. On the morning of June 12th, the guard assigned to B Block began his walk down the corridor. His job was to look each prisoner in the eyes. When he got to cell 138, he saw that Frank Morris was still in his cot, sleeping soundly. The guard entered Frank's cell and yelled at him to get up. Frank didn't move. Disobedience is the surest way to get in trouble on the rock. So the guard took out his baton and poked at Frank's body. That's when the head rolled onto the floor. <laughs> it took the guard a second to process what he was seeing. A dismembered head but no blood. And then he blew his whistle to summon for help. Within minutes, two more whistles echoed along B block as guards discovered fake heads in both cells of the Anglin brothers. Final count, three prisoners were gone. During their search, the guards also found a morose and disconsolate Alan West sitting in his cell with his fake head and partially displaced bed cover. It wasn't too hard to figure out what happened. To help in their search for the escapees, the authorities offered Alan West a deal. Tell us everything you know about the escape. How did they do it, but more importantly, where are they going? Do that, and we won't charge you with attempted escape, which, if we do, will extend your sentence 15 to 20 years. So West quickly agrees, and he starts singing like a bird, spilling everything he knows, including their intended destination, which he said was Angel Island, which is located just north of Alcatraz in San Francisco Bay. Now, this is testimony from a lifelong criminal, so perhaps we should take it at face value? Now we come to what I've always thought is a kind of funny part of his story. Alan West had a wife. Throughout the interview, prison officials assumed that Frank Morris, who had been tested and shown to have a 130 IQ, that's like genius level, they assumed that Frank Morris was the brains behind the scheme. And according to the Alcatraz website, 
Alan West took offense to that. He claimed it was he, and not Frank Morris, who solved many of the problems faced during the months leading up to the escape. Things like modifying the guts of a vacuum cleaner to be used as a motorized screwdriver to remove the cover of the duct which got them to the prison roof, or how to collect raincoats from the other cons. I mean, you know, the guy's got his pride, right? Now comes the biggest question of all. What happened to Frank Morris, John Anglin, and Clarence Anglin? Nobody, except perhaps those three men, knows the answer. We don't have many clues, and beyond just a few basic incontrovertible facts, just about everything is up for debate. So let's start with discussing those facts. Fact number one is no bodies were ever discovered or recovered, no remnants of any bodies that could be tied to the three inmates was ever recovered from San Francisco Bay. Fact two, two days after the escape, searchers found a makeshift paddle and a waterproof package of photos which belonged to one of the Anglins. That, those two items were found floating off the southern end of Angel Island. Maybe Alan West was telling the truth. Fact number three, nine days after the escape, shreds of rubber consistent with pieces of the raft, and therefore the raincoats, were found near the Golden Gate Bridge. Fact number four, the next day, June 22nd, one of the makeshift life preservers was found floating just 50 yards off the coast of Alcatraz. On July 17th, that's about five weeks after the escape, a body was seen floating about 20 miles northwest of the Golden Gate Bridge by the crew of this Norwegian freighter. It was clothed in full-length denim trousers, consistent with what would be the garb of a prisoner. That's it. Those are the only undisputed events and facts that we have after the escape, on which everybody can agree. And if you've been on the internet lately, you'll know how hard it is to get people to agree on anything. Good luck getting consensus on anything else. By the way, the body seen by the men on that freighter is a great example. They saw a body. Could it have been one of the escapees? Well, coroners from around the bay said the condition of the body as described by the freighter's crew. By the way, they were on their way making a delivery. It, freighters are like the classic, it takes two miles to make a left turn. They didn't have the time or the interest in stopping, so they took note of the body and they kept going. So simply by their description, the four coroners from jurisdictions around the bay said the condition of the body as described was consistent with what they would have expected for a body in salt water for five weeks. But the coroner for San Francisco disagreed. He even proposed a candidate for that body a man who had jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge just five days earlier. So much is conjecture, so much is supposition, so much is myth. Could the men have made it to Angel Island or somewhere else in the bay in that raft? No expert will say it's impossible. Most say it's highly unlikely. Now, if you're a fan of the Mythbusters TV show, you might remember they did a whole episode on the escape, and they proved building a raft exactly as the Anglins and Morris and West did, it is possible to cross San Francisco Bay in a homemade raft. Then we have the case of inmate John Paul Scott. Almost no one knows the story of John Paul Scott. Only six months after Morris Anglin and Anglin left Alcatraz on their raft. Scott somehow got off the island, and with the help of water wings he made from a pair of rubber gloves, he made it all the way to the Golden Gate Bridge, a distance of over two and a half miles. That's in the water, 
in December. Now, he couldn't too much once he reached land. In fact, he, he had developed hypothermia and was so exhausted that he, he couldn't even crawl, let alone run, when he was spotted by a group of teenagers, and he was very easily captured. But Scott presents the possibility, however small, that the men did make it, even if their raft had somehow burst open. So if they did, where did the men go? Why aren't there any reports of thefts of food, clothing, or car which could be tied in any way to the men? For many investigators, that indicates the men did not survive their trip. Because if they did, there would have been a rash of thefts. In fact, the US Marshal with whom I spoke was very clear on this point. He said, criminals, they don't change. Rarely do they change. They only know one way to approach life, and that's by breaking the law. And he believed it's extremely unlikely that Frank Morris, John Anglin, and Clarence Anglin would not have engaged in the same criminal activity which got them locked up. And again, even he said to me, it's unlikely, but not impossible. There were claims over the years by people claiming or claiming to be or claiming to represent one of the escapees. The FBI followed up on all of them determining that none were real. The mother of the Anglin brothers supposedly received flowers anonymously every Mother's Day until her death in 1973. After her death, <laughs> one newspaper down south reported that two very tall, unusual women in heavy makeup attended her funeral. But the US Marshals were watching the funeral, which cast doubt on this report they surely would have noticed the unusual women. Now we come to this tantalizing photograph, which you may have seen, showing two middle-aged men standing on either side of a large termite mound. Now, no one disputes the fact that the photo was taken sometime in the mid-70s, or because of that termite mound, that it was taken in Brazil. The photo was sent to the Anglin family by a boyhood friend of the brothers, a fellow named Fred Brizzy. Brizzy contended the men in the photo were John and Clarence Anglin. He claimed the brothers survived their trip across the bay and wound up in Brazil, where they went straight and owned a farm. Although one marshal assigned to the case called it, quote, the best actionable lead we have, he also said it could be a misdirection to throw the investigators off the trail. Another marshal was quick to say that Brizzy was, quote, a drug smuggler and a con man, and cast doubt on just about every part of his story. But this photo, it, it's hard to dismiss. The big question we have is whether the two men in the photo really are John and Clarence Anglin. Now, Ken and David Widmer are nephews of John and Clarence. And over the past few years, They've been working with investigators and documentary producers to uncover the fate of their uncles. In a 2018 History Channel documentary, the photo of the men was analyzed using facial recognition software to compare the brothers' mugshots with the men in this Brazil photo. The analyst said he believed they were a match. Two years later, using even better, more sophisticated AI technology, different company and a different analyst reported a high probability of a match between the men in the photo and the Anglins. So now I want to ask all of you, theories, suppositions, rumors you might have heard. If John, Clarence, or Frank is in the audience, you're welcome to stand up. and. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm going to take a break before I uh, talk about the novel which I uh, based on this escape. What do you folks think? How old would they be now? They'd be in their 90s now. They'd be in their 90s. They were all in their 30s when they escaped 60 years ago. And when was that picture taken? Uh, say sometime in the 1970s. They believe sometime 75, 76. 
Yeah, the age is right. Yes. Did the authorities go with Brazil? But they worked with the. First of all, it's there. There is what's called a, a red notice that is still out on the Anglins and French bars. What the U.S. Marshal, one of the U.S. Marshals I spoke with, said that there's a a cousin of the Anglins, not Ken and David, but one of the cousins who was going to go to Brazil to explore if he could find the farm. And he said, if he does, he'll be arrested by Interpol because he's interfering with an active case. Technically, it's active. There isn't like a whole team of people working on it. It's one of those cold cases that every once in a while, they give it to the rookie or <laughs> if they want to bust somebody's chops, they, yeah, give him the angle and file and see what he comes up with. But really, does anyone think that it's that maybe the Anglins made it? It makes sense that they would try to leave the country, mm -hmm. given that once they escape, they're not going to be um, welcome anywhere in this country or Italy. And how would they escape without a lot of money? Because they didn't have any money with them. Prisoners didn't make any money. They were any, whatever valuables they had were taken from them when they were checked in. They had it hidden somewhere. Ah. Hidden, like, in the main line somewhere? Yeah. Okay. And whoever picked them up. Ah. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. You said that there was no, there were no robberies or whatever. No. So maybe they had somebody pick them up. Okay. And drive them far away so they didn't have to rob Let's them. go with that theory. Right. Okay, so in order to have somebody waiting for them, yeah. they would have had to have communicated with that person. Mm -hmm. Every phone call, Every letter, there was no text or emails, everything, every communication was monitored and redacted in some cases. So what about, unless what about they, visitors to the prison. Well, that too. That's were also monitored. Those conversations were monitored as well. So unless they were, you know, Francis Bacon incarnate and somehow came up with a, a, a cipher that nobody could detect. By the way, they were smart. The Mars was smart, but I'm sorry. To get that type of, all that information required. Okay, here's the date, here's the time, here's where I need the boat to meet us, here's where we're definitely gonna land this raft, which we don't even know is gonna work. So that's a great thought, but the, the slim to none part, of the, it just, it's so highly unlikely that they could have made a connection with somebody outside of the prison. Go ahead. Yes, Paul, I said, yes, ma'am. Could, would it, is it possible, let's say they got the land, yep. that they could have somehow or another robbed someone mm -hmm. and the robbery was never reported. And there Did you not report a robbery? If someone had stolen clothes or food or your car? I think that's a possibility. I think, I'm, mm. I'm, I'm, I'm just, let, yeah. let's stay here. They, so their 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 careers were robberies. Yes. Yeah, that was so they were clever at robbing mm -hmm. things, so they weren't stupid. I, th I was thinking if they could figure out some recluse that they figure out for some reason has money or valuables, yeah. and the recluse doesn't even know it's missing, he's got Alzheimer's or something, mm -hmm. and you know, in other words, they rob from somebody who doesn't report the robbery. Okay. A slim possibility, sure. I have two that, questions. What happened to West? Uh, West served out the rest of his term. He was released, and then he promptly robbed again, <laughs> and they put him back in prison, and that's where he died. Oh, okay. I just so again, yeah. prisoners. These and were these were habitual. Yeah. Recidivists, I think, is the word. So they kept doing the and, same and thing. And there's no possibility of DNA because. They well, we don't have any DNA with which to compare. That, I was just going to say they. And so we have Ken and David Widmer. We have, uh, we have actually the body of Alfred uh, Anglin, who uh -huh. was killed trying to escape from uh, I think it was Florida State, no, Louisiana State Penitentiary. Okay. But he was he was killed trying to go over the wire, and because uh, he I guess he heard but that about his. Back in the sixties, they wouldn't have. No, but to keep the body actually is 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 was exhumed yeah. and DNA was taken, but there's nothing to compare yeah. it to. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. What about passports? Is there is that picture really in your Well, 
Um, if they, first of all, again, that, that sort of sheds doubt on this story because they bought a farm? Unless they had, this Brizzy guy was, and by the way, he, I go back to the old. Did they speak Portuguese? No, no, they were, they were good old boys from, uh, from Georgia. Yes, did you want to try something, Matt? Try well, I mean, something like. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I mean, there are pay phones. You could easily get a quarter, right? Mm -hmm. If you're leaving, so you could then call somebody that way to well, come pick you up. Well, they called the Anglin family in Georgia. They got to go through a long distance operator. Yeah. And we know that. Yeah, so I, I, these are the yes, ma'am. So we were. I have a question. Yes. I was excited to see this talk in the word Alcatraz because I can remember over 50 years ago reading a book, and I had to look it up today because I came up with the word butterfly, but it's papillon. Papillon, yes. Which means butterfly in yes. French. I didn't remember French title, I remembered butterfly. I mean, and somebody who escaped mm -hmm. Alcatraz. Yes. I remember. So that was the easy part. Once they got on the roof and they had the raft, they just had to use a rope, climb down uh, to the base of the prison, and their path to the beach was actually pretty clear. Yeah, I didn't mention it because it was almost, um, uh, it was actually, again, that was like the easiest part. Then once they're on the beach, squeeze box, get in the raft, and you're off. Yes, sir? Yeah, I was just wondering what was on Angel Island? What was the plan from there? That is another interesting, great question. So um, if you were an escaping prisoner from Alcatraz, would you go to a place which had a Nike missile base on it? <laughs> okay, that's what was on Angel Island. There was an army base. So let's leave Alcatraz Island with all those guards who have guns, and let's go to a place where there's a whole bunch of army guys and air force guys who have guns and a couple of nuclear tipped missiles. And, and so the, the, and the, supposedly, they were supposed to go to Angel Island, then they had to go around to the northern side of the island and then steal a boat and go over to Tiburon, which is the town just north of Angel Island, and then steal a car and then make their way. So the, 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 the series of, of in, nigh on an almost impossible things, not impossible, but almost, that they would have to do to make their way to the mainland, which was their goal, and then get a car. And again, there was no, there was, you look, there's no record of any Grand Theft Auto. I, I hear what you're saying about maybe food gets stolen, clothes get stolen so they can get out of their prison graves, but I'm sorry. Somebody steals my ride, I'm calling the cops. And there's no record of any auto thefts within like a two, three week period after they escape. So, we're left with fiction. And that's where my novel comes <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have uh, one question. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, it just came to me. Sure. So, do the uh, currents in the bay and the wind in the bay support the possibility that you could make the trip from one island to the other? So, according to the Coast Guard, uh, it, it doesn't it doesn't preclude the possibility, but it doesn't enhance the possibility. So the currents, because they shift with the tides, there is a tide in the bay because yeah, yeah. there's, there's a large opening at the gate, the Golden Gate. Yeah, yeah. So there is lots of movement in the water. Um, you know, they had to go at night. Now. I, whether or not they timed themselves, because the amount of time it would have taken them to row across the bay, the tide is going to shift anyway. So they couldn't rely upon the currents to help them. They had to be prepared to kind of run against that current. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, there's not much of a yeah. help. That little paddle that you showed. Yeah. Well, that was just one. Remember, they expected four guys. 
two guys on each side, you know, I mean, it's better than using your hands, I guess. But that's, you know, they, they may do, right, with what they had. So this is the novel that was released uh, June 21st, almost exactly 60 years after the escape. Um, like millions of people, I had seen the Clint Eastwood movie back when it came out. And like millions more, years later, I took the tour of the island prison. That's me arriving at the prison as, as a tourist back in 2011. It's a very pleasant ride from San Francisco to Alcatraz Island. Much nicer than when inmates were shackled to the hull of the launch, which took them to the island. It's a really, how many of you have been? Raise your hands, who have been to the tour. I, it's fantastic. I mean, give the National Park Service its props. It's a fantastic tour. It's very immersive. When I went, they gave you headsets and a, a little player. You hear the voices of inmates and the guards, along with the sound of steel doors clanging shut. I mean, I, I kept turning around every time you heard that clanging sound. That's my wife and daughter. My daughter would kill me if she knew I was showing this picture. But that's us at the uh, at Alcatraz. And I remember standing here in the same exercise yard where scenes of the Clint Eastwood movie were being filmed. And looking across the bay, you could see the Golden Gate Bridge. Now, we had just heard from one of the Park Service guides who told us a fascinating fact about the island. And it was at that moment I not only conjured the ideal for the idea for the novel, but also wrote its opening line. San Francisco was the cruelest trick ever played on the prisoners of Alcatraz Island. The city was only two miles away, so close that if the wind was just right, the cons could hear music and voices and laughter emanating from that glittering jewel of a city. And those nights, John Anglin, prisoner number AZ-1476 lay in his cot and covered his ears with a pillow. He couldn't bear the sound of all those happy, free voices. But tonight, as he stood at the water's edge of Alcatraz Island, he strained into the breeze to hear those sounds because tonight, he too would be free. That's the opening paragraph of my novel, Inseparable. The book was released by DX Barrows Publishing on June 21st. I have copies of the book for sale and signature here tonight. And if anyone is uh, interested, they're right here, and I'd love to sign and uh, sell them, sign you a copy. Folks, thank you so much for coming out tonight, especially for those of you who participated in our little think tank, possibly. It's, it's, uh, all ideas were welcome, and it, it, was a, it was great. You know, I appreciate everyone uh, participating. Do we have any questions? Yes? Yeah, one question. What do you think happened to the people? <laughs> Um, well, if you read the book, <laughs> um, I can do that. I honestly don't know. I really don't. I, the romantic in me mm -hmm. wants to believe that. First of all, John and Clarence, yes, they they were they were they were burglars. But to give you an idea about the type of of men they were, the last arrest that was made was for a bank robbery that they tried to pull uh, in Georgia. A bank robbery that they executed with a toy gun. And they asked John Anglin, they said, you, you walked into a bank and you tried to rob it with a toy gun. And he said, we didn't want to hurt anybody, we just wanted the money. <laughs> you know? So there's a, tr and by the way, Ken and David Wigler have a terrific website called the Anglin Brothers Museum. And from that, I, I saw pictures of John and Clarence. I learned about their life growing up as part of this very large family. Um, I grew to like these guys. And I, I would love to think that they made it somehow, whether or not it was in Brazil, or they ended up being lumberjacks in Oregon. I, I'd like to think for a while at least they got to be free. Frank was a very dangerous and violent man. Um, I, I don't see a lot of happy endings with him, but um, you know, so like anybody else, I don't know. I can only, as I say, I came up with this 
the plot for this book, just thinking about you know, Picasso. Yes? It, it's a little bit like the story of P.B. Cooper, uh, the guy who parachuted out of yeah. plane like mm -hmm. about 15 years uh, later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a four-part Netflix thing, I think. Yeah. It's uh, pretty good. It doesn't okay. answer the question. It doesn't answer the question, no. but it's got the, the same romantic kind of idea. Yes, it does. You know, we think, you know, what happened to Amelia Earhart? What happened to Judge Crater? There are, so, that's, that's what I think draws it, certainly what draw, drew me to this story. It's the unknown. You don't really know what happened. Yes, ma'am. There's two things that have occurred to me. Number one is that we, we very often bring this story or school movie, find ourselves rooting for the criminals to get away with it. For, for whatever reason, yes. they just seem likable. Very difficult thing to do, yes. Yeah, I agree. So that they changed their names, which I'm sure mm -hmm. they did, but yeah. you know, how would we know if they weren't criminals? And right, but, uh, but again, you know, how they do it without somebody noticing something. I mean, you know, people notice things in their neighborhood, right? They hear the rattling of a trash can, or they, they see a stranger walking near uh, near the school. We noticed things, you know, even back then it was strangers in it. I think, I think they would have been noticed. Was, was the escape publicized in the newspapers? Oh gosh, the oh yeah, okay. worldwide. Yeah, All right, so, it was so, the biggest story of the... Uh, so if you lived in that area, you knew the... It was front page in the Globe. I've got the, 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 the okay. Globe front page of that. that was day. it Wayne Globe? Well, yeah, of who was in the prison <laughs> that day. He was one of the inmates. I put Whitey in the book too, but you gotta be told about Whitey. <laughs> yes, sir. It was just an aside, but I yes. wonder if, the, if they had to have the fourth tail or if they might have made it. I don't think they made it, so. But if they had to have the fourth tail. Well, uh, yeah, extra weight in the, in, the, in the raft, but more strength to rope. Yeah. Who knows? Yes, sir. Yes, Pat. Well, the other thing I was thinking is like they never, they never actually tested the raft before using it, right? They, how could they? They couldn't inflate it. So like everything is deflated, everything's so. theoretical, but it could have just immediately popped or well, sank. We know, we know it made it at least 50 yards off the shore, because remember they saw that one piece of the raft floating there. Uh, again, you know, or was, did, did Frank say, let's throw a couple of pieces of the raft off, you know, a couple of pieces of raincoat shreds throw it off the raft as we make it to throw people off. I just thought of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. On the life vest. Yeah, 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 sure. sure. Off. You know, a little bit of deflection. What was the weather like that night? Beautiful. Beautiful June night, of okay. moonlit night. Yeah. yeah. Yes, ma'am. Kind of filming that body that was reported in the Well, oh, oh. <laughs> Here's the thing about the uh, sighting by the Nordfeld, I think. I don't speak Norwegian. Um, so they see the body, July 17, 1962. And they keep sailing up to Valdez or wherever they were going up, in, uh, up along the coast. And then when they return in October, that's when they finally radio the Coast Guard. Oh, by the way, when we were on our way out, we said, really, guys? I mean, so, you know, it, it, by, by October, it was a, it was, and so that body was long gone. I use that. I just downloaded it. Yeah. 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 Oh, well, fantastic. <laughs> I'm a Kindle person myself, too. But I have physical copies here. Again, folks, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you to the Lexington, uh, to the Cary Memorial Library for having me. Um, folks are here, and... Uh, well, unless you're giving them away, we're out of luck. We don't have any money. Oh, oh. <laughs> we walk. You walk.